Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Chris very grateful recovered alcoholic. And uh, I'm also a recovered drug addict, and I'm, I'm honored to, to be in the room with you guys. And um, as, as, it, as it turns out so many times, we, we, we preach to the choir. You know, we're talking to, the, to, the, to the, the cream of the crop, the little thumpers from hell. And, and it's just such an honor to know you. It's the best to get a chance to talk to some of you guys that have emailed us over the years, and we've talked to you on the phone, and you get to put a name with a face. And it's just, it's just an absolute honor. And I, uh, I want to... I want to thank you guys for coming and thank you guys for shucking out the, the cash to, to, to make it happen. It's just it's self-supporting through our own contributions. And so um, I had a guy stop me uh, not a lot long ago in one of the, another state in town. He's, you know, well, how much do you all charge to come speak? And it's like, buddies, you know, we it's it's expenses. It's a plane ticket and a cheap motel because they gave us a plane ticket and a really nice motel. Yes, Good God. Yeah. So uh, we appreciate it, the, 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 the daylights out of it. I um uh, I want to talk about this uh, this twelve step business a little bit. Uh, there's making making clear going in that the, there's a there's a difference between the book talks about working with others and sponsorship, and we may hit both a little bit. But 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 the requirements, the, the necessity. We talked about the the, the the three parts of the program, the, the three legacies that were given to us, and it's one of the things that uh, that our sponsorship lineage talked a lot about. And, and uh, you know, our our lineage goes. I mean, it's just. I mean, we can trace it straight back to Dr. Bob, and that doesn't make us better than anybody. It just means that the, 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 the simplicity of the message is quite clear. You, you work the steps at a quick pace, you have a spiritual experience, and then you turn around and help somebody else have the same experience. And it, it's not an option. And, you know, I, I suppose going into this, you know, 75 years, next, uh, next uh, week we'll have... Uh, uh, Probably better than seventy-five thousand uh, alcoholics, and, and I'm sure there'll be a little few dope fiends sneak in the mix there a little bit. But you know, folks descend on descend on, on San Antonio for the international conference over there, and, and uh, if any of you guys make it over there, we'll be there. And I will, this uh, uh, just let's find us. It's it's. I mean, it's just it'll be a, a, a cool ad- adventure there. But the the sense of I mean, seventy-five years is is how long we've been here as, as Alcoholics Anonymous. If y'all read the history of what what went on before seventy-five years, it was pretty dismal. The, the cats that are the real alcoholics, the the real drug addicts in this room that that are truly powerless over these substances. I mean, folks, we we died by millions since recorded time, uh, uh, horrible deaths, and uh, uh, and and we got the solution that works. And uh, for for I mean it's proven to work for all addictions, and and yet we have a tendency to want to water this message down to a to a spot where it doesn't work for anybody, and it, and it's like I I did some damage early on I think in, in in my zeal for for trying to carry the message you know we we we, we pushed a lot of people away in our in our our, our roughness and our, our gunslinger mentality you know you quoted the wrong page you stupid son of a bitch and. <laughs> You know, it's like, <laughs> I mean, you know, but a lot of us in this room, we study the book and we understand what's in the, in, in all the fellowships. So we got Alan on here and, and I know the other, some of Cocaine Anonymous and All Addictions Anonymous. And I know we got some Narcotics Anonymous folks. And, but in all of our fellowships, I mean, we study the literature and we get enough information to be, to be really, really dangerous if we're not careful, you know, and without the love and tolerance and a little appreciation for, for what people are going through. I don't want any of y'all to ever un- to misunderstand where, where we're coming from. I, I, I think a sense of urgency is there. I think a sense of, of rigidity at a certain point is necessary. There is only one message. One. That's the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. That was the original textbook. This is where it came from. We have other literature that's since been written in Alcoholics Anonymous. Again, it's been said. I'm going to say it again from the podium. A lot of that literature has gone out of its way to distract us from the basic textbook that we started with. You can read any of Alcoholics Anonymous pamphlets. If you're not careful, it'll free. Read question and answers on sponsorship. If you want to be completely just 
just have the breath taken away from you about sponsorship. I mean, go up to somebody that's fixing to think about sponsoring somebody. They're, they're a few months sober and they've had a spiritual experience and they want to start working with others. And then hand them a, hand them a, 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 a pamphlet that Q&A on sponsorship, say, well, well, here you go, buddy. This is what you need to brush up on before you can sponsor. And then the next shot you'll hear is them shooting themselves in the back room. <laughs> because it's somewhere deep down inside that pamphlet over towards the very end, it says you might want to bring those people through the 12 steps. I mean, basically, it's t- it's, it's, it'll, it'll, it'll distract you from our primary purpose about what we're doing. This idea that we can get sober and then all of a sudden that we have all the answers, you know? Have you all seen it in meetings? You know, you've got some guy that's always this opinionated bastard in there telling you, if you shouldn't be taking antidepressants. You know, it's like, oh my God, when did you get your MD? You know, you, I, I, I didn't know. And I divorced that asshole. Oh, no kid, not you. You're a marriage counselor now too, I suppose, you know? Oh, you don't need to make that amend. It's, it's the, the statute of limitations is gone. Oh, how cool. You And you're a lawyer too. Oh, my God. I think all of us should just shut up about stuff that we're not trained to do and do the one thing that we are trained to do. And that's to show the newcomer how to have a spiritual experience. I know some of y'all vehemently disagree with this, but I'm saying this is why we can't keep, I mean, you ask a little newcomers, well, why don't you want to work with, new, with, with, with a new guy? You with us? And, and Myers talks about it better than my twin brother. He talks about it better than anybody I know. Basically, if you can wear them down long enough, they'll finally just say, they'll tell you the truth. They say, because I don't know how. I'm afraid I'll hurt them. You, you follow? I don't have time. Because we've painted this picture that, that the minute you start sponsoring that your life ceases to be your own and it becomes the, you're engulfed with all these other little lives. And it's true to a point, to a point, but that's not the way it needs to be. Again, there's so much misunderstanding about what this entails. Bill Wilson in three places in the book. Remember from the very front, page 56, it talks about the cornerstone. And then it talks about on page 62, it talks about the keystone, you know, the arch in which we're going to walk, you know. And then what's the foundation stone? I was in a meeting not long ago, and I said, guys, what is the foundation stone that the book talks about? Every, everybody in the place. It was the first step. First step is the foundation stone. First step. It's not. Working with others is the foundation stone. That's what this whole thing is about. And why is it that, that, that as a fellowship, it is, it is turned to a spot where it's, an, it's optional? I was talking to a guy that come back into the hospital not long ago. This guy's had such a tough time staying sober. And I asked him, he's been to treatment probably six times. And I asked him, I said, buddy, buddy, give, me, give it to me straight. How, how come you relapsed? He said, oh, Chris, I know why I relapsed. You know, I got up that day and I, I forgot to ask God to keep me sober. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and some of you are not laughing because you think that that's necessary. Nowhere in the big book does it say I got to do that. Again, it drops us back to a self-help program. If 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 I have to walk on tiptoes and just walk this line and make everything just perfect, you with this? You forgot to ask God to keep you sober, so that's why you got loaded. That's a lie. That's not true. Y'all understand? It's an easy cop-out way. Ask the guy two seconds later. No, 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 no. Let me ask you a question. Have a good one, brother. Let me ask you a question. I said, get, get down to brass tacks. How many guys were you sponsoring? This guy was out a couple, couple, a year and a half. How many guys were you sponsoring? None. Book said, Bill, we read it last night in Bill's story. You can't survive the certain trials and low spots ahead unless you work with others. It's, it's not an option. That's how we get out of our head. That's how we give this, this whole circle triangle business. What goes around comes around. Y'all understand that? The little stuff that I do over here is going to affect me back over there. That's just spiritual principles. Working with others is not an option. It, I, but I understand, guys, that it's, it's uncomfortable. It's easy to say. That's why we got so many people spinning their wheels in the steps. I got a guy I'm sponsoring right now, so I think I need to go back through a four-step. We, we just did a four step. You, you probably haven't made all your amends yet. Now it's time to let's go. Let's, let's start working with some drama. I don't think I'm ready yet. Don't care if you think you're ready yet. <laughs> Didn't ask you if you thought you were ready. I said, let's go get another drunk. You, y'all understand that? Nobody's ready. Any of you guys are, <laughs> oh, God. oh my God. This is the most uncomfortable thing in the world. God dang, I'm about two months sober and this little guy comes up after the meeting and, and just, <laughs> I can see him coming. It's just exactly what, what, uh, what Charlie was talking about. And this little guy's coming, and I look back down at my baby. Oh, God, please no. Please no. Because I'd said something in a meeting, and I'd made, I'd made a mistake. I made eye contact with this guy. I'm a cook, and he's a cook. And, and I was like, we just like, and I was like, oh, no, no, no. And he's... 
you know, keep coming back. It works, it works. And I'm looking down because I don't want him to come over. <laughs> and sure shit. And here he comes. Like, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? Oh, yeah, okay. Anyway. So I gave him my number. We talked for a little bit. And I get on home and somebody calls and, and on the phone. And this, this girl that I'm, I'm with at the time, she just, he's on the phone. The guy wants to talk to you. And I said, oh, sh- no. I'm not here, you know, because I don't want to talk to this guy because I don't know what and he, she said. Yes, you are here. And this is like, anyway, he wants me to come talk to him a little bit. And so I, I do. And I, he's, he works at the kettle down the street. And so I go down and just, I'm going to sit with him. He's got to go to work at 10. You with us? The meeting was at eight. And we're going to sit there for an hour until he goes to work. So he won't drink. He's brand new. Works okay. That's fine. That's all I got to do is I talk to him. He said, yeah, don't forget your big book. And I was like, oh, shit. Okay. So I take the big book and we sit down. You with us? Two hours later, I come back and she's all freaked out. She thinks we both got drunk, you know, because I'm brand new in this. And and I, but I walk back into the room and she goes and she finally catches full light of me and she says, "What happened to you?" Wow, you're not going to believe what just just happened, man. I just told him some stuff that was going on, and you know what? He understood everything I was saying. He could identify exactly with me on working on the line and flipping eggs and wanting to drink. And he and God dang, we just we just got carried away. I'm sorry, I'm late, but God dang, we just y'all follow. Have you ever been in a deal like that? All of a sudden, you, you're the connections made. Oh my God, I still want to cry every time I think about it. Listen, guys. That's what it's about. Now, here's a little guy that spent 10 years in therapy standing in front of mirrors <laughs> telling myself what a good boy I am. I'm sorry. I'm not going to knock it. This works for you. That's great. But I'm going to tell you, you want to feel great about yourself. You want to finally feel some purpose on this earth. You sit down across the table from a little, little, a little alcoholic, a little crackhead from hell, you know, who thinks that nobody understands what he's been through. You with us? And all of a sudden, all you got to say is a few little words, and all of a sudden, the, 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 the common bond is made. And what he's going to ask you eventually is, how did you get sober? We've laughed about it from a thousand podiums, buddy. That's when you set the hook, buddy. You got this big book right here, and the same thing that got you sober is going to get him sober. Because it's the same thing that got my sponsor sober, and the same thing that got his sponsor sober, the same thing that got his sponsor sober, the same thing that got Dr. Bob sober, Bill Will. You with me? We don't have to reinvent the stupid wheel here. You're not counselors. You're not therapists. They ask you about that, give, give them a phone number of a qualified person to go to. We're not some kind of a stupid cult. We're a spiritual program of action. Our job is to share our experience, strength, and hope with that newcomer so that they can come and have the same cool life we've got. But we're the only people equipped to do that. Somewhere along the line, guys, I'm going to tell you, and I'm, I think I know where, we got way off the page. Back in, last night in the story, we were talking, the treatment centers got involved in this business in the 70s in the United States, huge. We just, God, it used to be back before the 70s, if you needed treatment, buddies, I'm telling you, you had to go to a hospital and get detoxed professionally and blah, blah, blah. And I got to tell you, they passed some laws in the United States to make treatment centers okay to, on every corner. They were like, they were like, Tim Hortons. They were just like, what? <laughs> there's another one. There's another one. There's another one. They opened up and every, and we're grinding out a lot of these people and every one of these places, they're cranking out. Some of these places had the clear message out of the book and some of these places were so far off page it's not even funny. You with us? That's why we got so many people with so many opinions about this. I got this, this, a lot of you guys have heard me read this. Got it out of a box 459 about, I think it was in 2000. And it's, it was a little article called Intergroup Ask, Where Have All the Volunteers Gone? I was fascinated when I read it. It says, the most frustrating thing about answering Intergroup's phones, this is in New York, uh, says Bob R., manager of the Intergroup Association in New York City, is finding an AA member willing to take a 12-step call for some sick alcoholic who has phoned us for help. Sometimes it takes up to 20 calls to identify just one willing volunteer. Some of the responses we hear when a live member actually does answer the phone What's a 12-step call? How did you get my phone number? Do you mean you actually want me to talk to someone who's still drinking? Oh, my gosh. The saddest response came from a member who exclaimed, No, I can't do it. I'm busy all day. Today is my sobriety anniversary. <laughs> that guy's going to die. You know that? I mean, I, just, I don't know. It's just we, we read it but to give you a clear idea of what, what this is about. Some of you guys, you're in little clusters where everybody understands their little marching orders. But the truth of the matter is, guys, most of those people out there in the real world sitting in, in mainstream AA don't understand that this is our job. 
you know, working with a drunk is the, is the gravy to the whole thing. All the rest of the 11 steps get us ready to do this thing called the 12th step. If you don't, it, it's like, just like nothing but foreplay, but never the orgasm. It's yeah. like, you know, I don't know why, I don't want to do this anymore. It's not fun. I, no, no shit. <laughs> I'm with you. I under I, I probably have come up with a better analogy, but I mean I'm just <laughs> but I'm just saying, you know, this is it, uh, it's, um, it's optional and everybody wants to let everybody off the hook and it's this the bottom line is is you as you work the 12 steps, then you get the good stuff and that's the, the opinions just all over the world, you know, you you can't sponsor to your 2 years sober. You can't sponsor to your year sober. You can't chair a meeting to your 6 months sober. You can't do that. What but none, nowhere in the book does it say that. If you read the history, what is different between Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob and the first hundred that got sober in 1935? What is different from them and us today? We have some different drugs out there that are that are goofy that we didn't have back then, I suppose. But but the disease hasn't changed a damn bit. What's different? But it was not optional back then. We got you sober so you could come with us and help us carry the message of hope. That's how this thing spread and grew. And somewhere along the line, we got complacent. This is why I still say our success rates are so low today. In Alcoholics Anonymous, I can guarantee you, because we simply don't work with others. We, we sit in meetings, open discussion hell, and talk about our day, and you're effing grandkids one more time. You, and everybody, oh my gosh, how good, cool is that? No offense. And then we go home and gradually get uncomfortable in our skin and the obsession comes back and we drink. You follow? And then the old timers flip it back in our lap. You just didn't want it bad enough. Y'all understand? When do we remember that our primary purpose is to carry this message? People hang around AA for years. I know there's some of you in here that have been here for years and years and years and have never sponsored someone. And, and, I'm, and I'm not trying to shame you here at all. I'm just trying to say you are missing the coolest miracle on earth, the, the, the beauty of seeing what this program looks like in, in, in all of its facets, in all of its layers. Whole, the whole world is confused about what AA is today. Watch Hollywood, read the literature, read a thousand books where the punchline of, 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 of every stupid joke out there because the, the clear message has been so watered down. Make sense? God almighty, it freaks me out. I'm going to show you something real quick. I got this uh, from a, a little guy in another fellowship. His parents gave me this, this card. I knew, uh, I knew the parents. I didn't know this gentleman that wrote this. He's, he's dead now. He's passed away. But... He wrote this on one of his trips to another treatment center. At the end of this little letter, it says, I hope to one day make you all proud that you have me in your lives. Maybe someday down the line, I can freely give to others that which has been freely given to me. Did you get it? Maybe someday, when I'm perfect and I have time and it fits into my schedule and all the stars line up, maybe then I can get a chance to go work with a drunk. This is not convenient. Everybody wants to get sober. Everybody wants to do this right up until the point somebody asks them to do something that they don't want to do. You follow that? Remember the night that you got to get up Thursday night and there's something great on TV and you got to go chair the meeting and, ah, oh, shoot. And you turn the TV off and go chair the meeting? Yeah, how cool is that? Yeah, and then you leave the meeting saying, that's, that's why I chaired the meeting. That's why I did it. Because the miracle starts to take place when we get to do things that we don't really want to do. I don't want to work with drunks. Y'all understand that? For a shy guy like me, and I am off this podium, I don't want to work with drunks. I don't want to sit and spend time with somebody else. But i got to tell you, the miracle that takes place as a result of doing this will blow you out of the water. I, it, it, it absolutely leaves me speechless. One of the reasons that people don't want to do it is that they make it so goddamn complicated. It's just not. It's just... What's our job as, a, as an alcoholic? What's our job as a sponsor? If we're sitting there working with somebody. What are we supposed to do? Let me give you the rundown because it's not that difficult. 
again, everybody thinks they have to know the book and have it memorized. It's just, you have to have an experience of working the steps. And basically, that's it. The first thing I'm going to do with a newcomer, when I find out he comes up and talks to me, he wants me to sponsor him for whatever reason. You with us? I, I separate the wheat from the chaff. I get a lot of people that want me to sponsor him because of this, because what, I speak from the podium. And they think, oh, you'd be a great sponsor. But see, my time is so stretched out. If you need somebody with a lot of time and attention, I'm not a good sponsor for you. And I talk to them about that going in the door. But the first thing I do, Scott and I were talking about it, first thing I do is I qualify this calf. Earlier when I'm talking about the singleness of purpose, I came across pretty rigid. I want to make sure you all understand. My job as a responsible member of this fellowship is to qualify the newcomer and make sure he's in the right room. You with us? We have over 200 12-step fellowships out there. I think it's pretty arrogant of us to think that AA can treat it all. There's some wonderful fellowships out there that focus on treating it all. They're prepared for that. The cats in AA are not. We're there to treat drunks. If you happen to be a drunk and an addict, you come on, we can help you out. We we got you covered. Y'all follow? But the, our job is to qualify this little newcomer and make sure that he understands what this is about. I got sober in uh, '87, and uh, about two years later, one of my best friends he went back out again. And every time we sat down with this guy for those two years, we you know we'd go to coffee after and and eat, and go to Denny's and eat a sandwich or something. And he said, and we had more conversations about this. He said, "Don't you ever wonder if you're really an alcoholic or not?" You, you with me? I, no, I don't ever wonder that because I had a sponsor that night in 1987 after seven years of wondering that. I had a sponsor sit down and open the book and ask me the two questions to qualify me for the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And once I qualified myself, I knew I was home. You with us? There wasn't any question. I don't know if I'm an alcoholic or not. The shame on us. Exactly what we talked about. Whose responsibility was that? We assume that the newcomer knows the questions. How arrogant of us. Y'all understand that? It's like I was telling you about that meeting I went to in San Antonio not long ago, and, and I walked into the rooms and nobody nobody qualified. They didn't ask me if I was sober, if I was new to the program. They didn't ask me anything. They just said, welcome, welcome to our meeting, and that was it. They didn't show me where the bathroom was. They didn't tell me where the coffee was. They didn't show me. You know, let's, if, it, if I'd have been a newcomer, I, I would not. Next time you're in, you're in a home group meeting, close your eyes and sit in the back of the room and let everybody else share, okay? And close your eyes and see if during that meeting, you could glean enough to get an adequate presentation of the program from that meeting. It'll, oh, what an experiment that would be. Y'all understand? I've done it in my own home group and was sickened by what I heard. We forget, we assume that the newcomer knows the questions to ask. They don't. They're scared. Remember the first time you came in? Yeah. Yeah, we just need to grab these little guys and take care of them and nurture them while they're there because we may only get one shot. That's just the bottom line. Dr. Bob said it, supposedly in his writings, carry the message, and if you must, use words. <laughs> yeah. We're going to sit down and qualify this little cat. We're going to ask him the two questions. The summation of those questions are on page 44. Drinking, control. Can you control it once you put it in your system? Given sufficient reason, can you stop and stay stopped? Nope. Welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. You follow? <laughs> it's just that simple. We don't give a rat's butt about your DWIs or the liquor stores you robbed or the blackouts. The book uses two questions to qualify an alcoholic. And i got to tell you guys, in my other fellowships and with the drugs, we've used the same two questions to qualify them too. It's just that simple. Make sense? Stay out of the drama. Sat down with this guy, and I'm going to ask him point blank. I says, are you going to be willing to go to any lengths to do this? We Everybody does that. You with us? The, These guys come to treatment. Are you willing to go to any length? Yeah. And he's crying and slinging snot. I'll give my firstborn child. I'll do anything to get well. You with us? And about three days later, just exactly like Katie said, their egos start to rebuild themselves. Now they're sitting in the back of the room with their sunglasses on, their arms folded, and they're not quite sure now. You know? Maybe I was being a bit rash last night. You know, three... <laughs> About the time the Ativan starts to leave their system, the detox, and oh my God. Uh, I explained to them what any links looks like. We're going to work the steps quickly, do exactly what the book instructs us to do, and then we're going to go get us another drunk. You with us? We're going to go to some meetings. We're going to sponsor some people eventually. That's, that's the culmination. If they're willing to do that, I'm willing to take them through. It's just, I'm going to make it perfectly clear from the beginning that we're going to work the steps quickly. I know some of the fellowships don't, don't agree with that. I'm coming straight out of the big book, and it says quickly. You with us? Fearless and thorough from the very start always gets translated to take your time. <laughs> that is not what it means. I'm, I've used the analogy a thousand times. My, my wife wants me to be fearless. When I'm washing dishes, fearless and thorough from the very start. 
You with us? That means, Chris, quit leaving stuff in the sink. Wash them all. But don't take six months to do it. <laughs> it's the same thing. It's the same, same thing. I'm going to sit down with this guy afterwards. I'm going to explain what the deal is. I'm going to show him. We're going to talk seriously about this accountability. I was talking to a little brother. We've got a little mad dog group that gets together every other Thursday. We hold each other accountable. Where are you at in the circle and triangle? And that's my job as a sponsor. I'm going to get you through the steps. I'm going to talk to you about the traditions. I'm going to introduce you to some of the AA-related uh, 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 literature that we're talking about. But my main job is to hold you accountable to make sure you're in line. You with us? That means what? Y'all ever hear the term AA etiquette? It's, it's kind of a lost art in certain parts of this world, I can assure you. Y'all are probably y'all are the classiest people I know, but I, back in Texas, sometimes it gets a little goofy. AA etiquette is important, and this is what these old-timers took time with me to show me when I got there so that I wouldn't embarrass myself in public. It makes sense? Little guys that come in like that, and say, oh, let him have his own experience, and then they get their feelings hurt, and then they leave, and they never come back. You with us? Because nobody told them that it wasn't appropriate to do what they're doing. I'll give you an example. What about just uh, the singleness of purpose business that we're talking about? Why is it that we got off the page with this, I'm an alcoholic and an addict? Y'all follow? If you're in an AA meeting, why don't you just introduce yourself as an alcoholic? Because anything else you add to that is going to separate you from the person sitting next to you. You with us? What are we trying to do here? Because we saw this in the 80s in treatment. I'm an alcoholic and an addict and a, and a sex addict and a compulsive gambler. And oh, shit, there's one more. I'm forgetting what it is. <laughs> like, oh, what? And the, guy, and the guy sitting next to you moves his chair over a little bit, you know? Because he, he just wanted to talk to another drunk. Y'all understand? Oh, my gosh. When I'm in Narcotics Anonymous or Cocaine Anonymous, I introduce myself as a drug addict. I'm, I'm not an anda. Mark was the one that cleared me up on that stuff. Chris, why do you do that? Are you a, are you a good sign painter? I said, no, I'm a crappy sign painter. Then why don't you introduce yourself as a crappy sign painter? Same thing, isn't it? I thought it was the truth. I talked to the guys about being punctual. Y'all have been great today. I can't believe we can herd this many cats back in this room as well as well we did. You know, get your coffee, sit down early, get ready for the meeting. You know, if you got to get up and go, you're a little just like that. Well, just go. You know, <laughs> I can't, just can't imagine what her bladder looks like. Oh my God, it's just it's like, <laughs> it's like just constant. <laughs> We talk seriously about getting up. You got to go do that. But I've watched these guys in the meetings and sit there, you know, half a dozen times getting up. Have you ever been at a podium trying to share something and get something from the heart like this? And a guy gets up and got them goddamn flip flops on, click, clack, click, clack, click, clack, right in front of the click, clack. Gonna go get him a stop, talk to the little good brother on the end, and goes back and gets his coffee like that. Just oblivious to what's going on. But you see, I used to do that until somebody said, Chris, it's disrespectful. Get your coffee and sit for an hour. 45 minutes, you can do it. I know you can do it, you know? <laughs> Dress appropriately. I've come from work and old busted out shirt and cut off with, uh, you know, not good. You know what I'm saying? And wondering why people didn't treat you with respect. He says, buddy, just clean up a little bit. You know, you're coming. This is a, this is a picture here. You know, you got a businessman coming in here. You look like you just crawled out from under a, under a bush. Why don't you, you know, it's, Come on, guys, we're not supposed to dress up for these meetings, but God dang, pay attention. You know, again, somebody's watching you. Make sense? How, how are you dressing in a meeting? God dang, put some clothes on. Be appropriate. My sponsor talked to me specifically in AA about not chanting. Y'all may be in an area where they chant, but we do people a really disservice, especially in treatment when we don't tell them about this. Y'all follow? Y'all know what I'm talking about, the chanting? When you read how it works, one, two. Came to believe it, but two, you know, and it's just like, come on, everybody, chant. <laughs> and the little guy gets out of meeting. Oh, in Texas, and especially in Cocaine Anonymous, they just do it nonstop, and it's chanting like a three ring circus in there. And it's like, it's appropriate, I suppose, in the fellowship if you're there, and that y'all, but to tell the newcomer, you're with us, they just you put a big target. I'm new, you know, just don't, just don't do that. It's not. It's not that. Talk to these guys about service commitment. Guys, there's nobody in Alcoholics Anonymous that gets by without a service commitment. Y'all are clear with that, aren't you? You get a job in AA and I promise you, you'll stay sober. You don't get a job in AA and I promise you, you'll get bored to tears and you won't stay sober. Get a commitment. 
My guys, I got to tell you guys, I'm watching the guys I'm sponsoring. I'm paying close attention to what they're doing. And if they're not getting, I mean, jumping for, for responsibility, I'm asking them when we get to our accountability what, what they're doing there. No free ride. Come on, guys. How many people died for, so that we could be here today? And the least we can do is, is like participate wherever we can. Same people every year do the conferences, do the coffee, do all the setup. And everybody else gets the free ride. It's like, what can you do next year to be to participate, to help? This is just going to help you stay sober. Working with, uh, with others, we talked to the sister less, earlier about this. On page 129, it gives me clear marching orders. Early sobriety, go work with a drunk. You follow? Don't listen to that nonsense that you're too not sober enough to help anybody. My guys, I'm going to tell you it's not in the big book, but health and exercise is so goddamn important it's not even funny. We talk to these guys about that nonstop. So this big book refers to it, but they don't get down to, to, to brass tacks about it as much as I do because I just think it's important. So many people think that they can get all of this that they need from just doing the work, and the truth is they've sat on their butt for all these years. And they're in bad shape and they need them. You know, buddy, let's, you don't need another four-step. You need to get off your butt and go walk around the block a couple of times. Get the, get the heart rate up a little bit. You'll feel a lot better. You know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Real quick, guys. But the, but the, but the, the people that I've watched get active in this fellowship and to do, and do this work are the ones that are staying sober. Uh, the people that want to let them off the hook. Again, we talked some of these kids don't seem to need to do anything in order to stay sober. Uh, I don't know what to say about that. I'm, that's not my experience. But I, the little guy that comes to me, I owe them the responsibility. Bill Wilson says that we each of us, we have a, we have a responsibility to give the newcomer an adequate presentation of the program. What does adequate mean? It means do, do I have enough to, to fulfill my responsibilities in Alcoholics Anonymous to give back? That's all we're asking. And, um, and if you can do that. Some people say, no, they don't want to play. Then bye-bye with them. Uh, guys, I've never fired a sponsee, but I've said this to, to uh, many of them. Maybe it's perhaps time that you find somebody else to work with that would help you a little bit more because I'm obviously not reaching you. Make sense? Because we're not going to hang on to people. How many of you guys as sponsors in here realize the times that you spend about 90% of your time working with one or two people and about 10% of your time working with a whole bunch of other people? You, you follow? There's a problem with those two that you're spending all your time with because if you're spending your time with these guys and they don't even seem to want it, it's time to go focus on the ones that do want it. Y'all, y'all understand what I'm saying? Nobody's kicking anybody out. Nobody's firing anybody. But guys, I'm going to give it to the people that really want it. That's what this is about. I got to. Bill Wilson in the front of the book, he says, each of us in our own way get to carry the message of hope to the newcomer. And that's the piece that I want to, I want to leave you with real quick. The, I think Bill Wilson means what he says when he wrote that. Each of us in our own way. If if we can all get on the same playing field, one of the biggest problems we have in our fellowships, and all of our fellowships, is the stupid meeting formats. Some of you guys go to groups, and they've had the meeting formats there for 20 years. You're with us? And they have never been changed or tweaked. They're not working. Nobody's staying sober to speak of. You're with us? But we've got the same formats. Traditions allow us to change these formats. More literature-based meetings would allow us to push more people through this work so we can come out the other side and be more useful. Make sense? So working with others ceases to be an option in those groups. Everybody, people want to talk nonstop about personalities. There's this old man, and every time, no, I don't want to hear it. If the meeting format allows you to talk about your day, you're going to talk about your day. You, you follow? I, and if you want an endless supply of that, then keep that meeting format there. But if you can work the steps through the, in other words, study the literature and get excited about this work, then what happens is there's a whole bunch more people lockstep sponsoring other people. Make sense? And each of us in our own way. You look at some nice guy like Bruce back up there and he's the nicest, kindest, gentlest guy you'd ever want to come across and he's going to carry the message of hope his way. Y'all understand that? Ernie, his way. Ron, his way. Not my way. We're all going to come at this with love and tolerance. We're not going to try to beat anybody up or jam a big book up their butt or threaten them, back them into a court. You'll follow? But it's just real simple. We have one simple message. It's the spiritual experience. It's God. When are we going to get to a spot in our fellowships that we, 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 we acknowledge to the world that this is unapologetically about the spiritual experience? Uh, 
No religion here. No jamming anybody's belief system. But this is unapologetically about the spiritual experience. The old boy that I got sober with about six months in looked over his little towel, over his little hot water. We were washing cups. He's about 30 years sober. And he looked at me and he said, Chris Raymer, I'm going to tell you, we were so proud of you for coming. We we're so glad that you stayed with us. We need you. And I've shared a million podiums, folks, about this. We've got to understand that what we need in this thing is the, the newcomer. Two things happen when we work with others. One, we get a new member. We got him by the neck. You're, you're hog tied him so he can't get away, you know? We got a new new member now. And what happens is because I've hog tied him, I get I grow spiritually by doing that. So I don't have to relapse and leave. I get to stay. Y'all understand? And our old timers, we get to keep them, and the newcomers coming in, we get to go. I'm gonna tell everybody in here. Guys, please. Stop using the excuses that I haven't been sober long enough to stop this idea of working with others. You young people in here, I'm going to tell you, I was talking to two or three people in this room, and my travels around the world, Alcoholics Anonymous, don't even mention the other fellowships for heaven's sake. You should see what's going on in those fellowships. Alcoholics Anonymous is being changed by... by militant 20-year-olds, you know, that are absolutely lockstep with good sponsorship in the book. Standing up, starting new meetings and, and, and doing the things that need to be done. And it's like for so many years, we just, we just, you know, pizza, aren't you cute? You keep coming back, you little knucklehead, you, you know, and we just, you know, we treated them like second class citizens. You know, they don't have like young adult alcoholism. They got the same damn disease that's killing me. And they've stayed, taken their place in the fellowship and they're allowing us to go from places that we've never been before. It's a pretty, pretty cool thing. A lot of old timers in here. I got to tell you guys, there's a lot of folks in this room with long term sobriety. And I'm going to tell you from the bottom of my heart thank you for staying in this fellowship thank you for taking the heat for every one of you that ever walked in the door with a big book and had somebody roll their eyes and make fun of you i'm going to tell you you're doing what we're supposed to be doing and the rest of you can go pound the sand tell you again the sense of responsibility that i feel for this fellowship and for what we're supposed to be doing here i mean this is where it all boils down guys our sense of responsibility who do you know you think that you know who god's going to use to help you but the, shh, i was in a meeting two weeks ago i'm sitting in my chair there at the outpost there at ingram solution group how country is that huh and i'm sitting there like this and this little guy's across the deal and he's coming back it's the same kind of scenario i've seen a thousand times and he's making his way my way and i says and i leaned over to patty my wife's sitting there next to me she and i says oh here he comes man he's going to come ask me to sponsor him she says ben you've got a bunch you maybe ought to i said i know i know but i'm gonna i don't know i'll talk to him anyway i'll let him down easy and he pushes me aside you follow? I mean, steps around me to get to the little guy that I work with and sitting behind me. <laughs> and, part of, and, and part of me did this. And then I thought, what the hell am I? I mean, what? what? I thought I shared pretty good in the deal, you know? But that's what you got to understand. There's a little guy that I work with in there, a little fried pie. You know, and I've had this conversation with him, and he, he's not quite all there yet. You know, he's not hitting on quite all cylinders, you know. But, he, but, he's, but he's doing pretty good. You with us? But this little guy was sitting back. I mean, that's how God works. That's how, that's how this thing works. God used something he said that clicked with this little other, other little fried pie. You know? <laughs> And the two little fried pies come together. He didn't want nothing I had. He wanted me out of the way so he could get to my little brother, you know? Y'all you follow what I'm saying? And the little guy asked the question. I just got out of a treatment center. I got a fist, four-step ready. I need a sponsor. And I looked around and I met... God damn it. Shit. I met his little eyes like we always do. I'm looking over my little glasses like this straight on because the question has been asked. I need a sponsor. And the little guy looked at me with terror in his eyes. You with us? And I looked I, like, and he said, yes, I would be glad to do that. Another one in the trench. Another one in the trench with a shovel helping us dig. Not standing around the side with a clipboard telling us what we're doing wrong. This is, this is where our fellowship's at. 
I can't wait till next week at International. 75,000 drunks get there in the big meeting. Are we all standing around singing Kumbaya, kissing each other's butts, talking about how great we're doing? Are we out there in the trench actually carrying the message, doing what we're supposed to be doing? Make, does that make sense? Because I got to tell you this, and I got to shut up. A bunch of you don't understand what I'm saying because you're not in the trench. And I'm encouraging you to get in the trench. You, you can't, Mark said it, it's the last time I'm going to say it. How do you know what you don't know? It's easy to sit on your butt and say, oh, it must be nice sponsored. But till you sit down next to somebody with a book open and you start to qualify them and all of a sudden you go, oh my God, I'm not insane. I'm not, cra- Jesus, I'm an, al- I'm just an alcoholic. Oh my goodness. And guess the next best news is, within a couple of days, you're going to get taken to a spot where the desire to drink's going to leave you. And you see the hope and the tears comes to his eyes. And you go out to the coffee room and his family's there and they're all hugging each other. And the lady looks over and says, thank you. Shit, I didn't do that. God did that. All I did was volunteer and say, okay, I'll do what you asked me to do. I'll suit up and show up and I'll be a servant. I'll be a servant to you. That's all we do. And then the miracle starts to take place. You with us? And while I'm doing that, guess who's watching my butt? Guess who's taking care of my life? I don't know what that power looks like any more now than I did 22 years ago. But I guarantee you, God's in charge and he's watching me. It's the common problem and the common solution that ties us together. Come on, guys. Why do we bond with so many of y'all for so long? Why are, why are we so bonded at a cellular level with so many of you guys in this room? Because you're having the same experience we are. This is a life-changing event. It's not some kind of a chicken shit self-help program. This is a life-changing event. And anybody wants encouragement to come along? Buddies, in your own way, pick up the cards, call us, stay in touch with us, because I guarantee you we'll help you anyway. Because I know you're going to help us. That's how this thing works. I'm sure I'm honored to be here. Thanks, guys, for letting us come. Some questions, if you guys have any, for the last uh, 10 minutes. I know, it's like wiping the tears away. The magic, I'm telling you, that magic is in the 12th step. Yes. Hi, Scott. I just want to acknowledge you and thank you for coming here on your own dime and the difference you made for us all. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. It was my husband's dime. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, I mean, that's a really... Um, it, it, well, the, the quick... <clears throat> Do whatever you like, darling. Thank you. Uh, I'll answer the question, and my husband may have some input on that. Uh, the, the, there are over 200 12-step programs out there, and the difference between all of them is the first part of the first step and the second part of the last step. And it's what's our problem and who we carry the message to. So that need for identification, I think, is very important. And uh, otherwise, you know, I come in and I say, hi, my name's Katie, I'm uh, uh, I'm alcoholic and uh, addicted to fudge. Is that okay? I'm Katie, I'm alcoholic, and I'm also a fitness professional. I mean, see what I'm saying? And so what, what, what the problem seemed to have happened 20 years ago when I came in or 25 years ago is that I thought the reason that they didn't want to hear about my drug addiction was because they wanted to keep the dope fiends out of the room. And I thought, well, these alcoholics are a bunch of old cratchy old guys. And, you know, I happen to be addicted to a lot of dope. And, and, but that's not what it was. It was the difference between the identification and it was the singleness of purpose. Uh, personally, I've tried to work with just a crackhead that is not alcoholic. I can't do it. I'm telling you what, the, the, I can't, I cannot identify with the level of what she's done with crack. And I did a ton of cocaine and I don't get crack. And that's all she was, was crack. So she wasn't alcoholic. Did that answer the question? No? Real quick. The, the solution's, the solution's gonna be exactly the same. 
You follow? But until the identification piece is there, the deal is, is that I'm an alcoholic and an addict, and I qualify for a bunch of different fellowships. But let's say uh, I had a little guy come up the other day who was asking me about sex addiction, and he says, you know, I've had a little problem, blah, blah, blah. And I'm looking at this guy, and, and I found myself stepping back a little bit because I, he's freaking me out, and I have no point of reference to what he's talking about. Now, this is life-threatening for him. But had I been a sex addict, I could have bonded with him. We could have gone off and had coffee, and I could have given him the solution. But he's not going to hear the solution from me because all I can do is make jokes about his sex addiction. You all follow what I'm saying? And this is, this is why we're seeing so many pill addicts founder out there in, the, in, in, in our recovery community because there, there's some great fellowships out there now called o, uh, OA, Opiate Addicts Anonymous, and this stuff to get, to, to get down to the brass tacks of some of this identification stuff. It, but, but until somebody understands kind of where you're at, they're not going to listen to the solution. But you don't understand. You're right, I don't. And it's arrogant of us to think that we understand. It's just, it's just, you, you follow him? It's like me talking to a woman who's been, been raped. But intellectually, I understand what, it, what happened. S- spiritually, deep down inside, do I understand what happened? Not a clue. And it's, it's stupid of me to think that I would be able to identify with what this woman's going through. And I need to flip her to somebody that understands, I think. Doesn't mean that I can't. Part of my job, again, is the qualifying that we were talking about, Scott and I were talking about earlier, is helping them get into the right room so that they can get comfortable in their skin. I'm not sure. Go ahead. Then, then, then we get this question every time we do this. It's like, then there's no, it's a moot point. If you can qualify for, if you're an alcoholic and a drug addict, go to any meeting you want to go to and help anybody you want to go, you want to help. How, I mean, we call <laughs> double winners. You know, it's like, oh my God, just, you're just, <laughs> Move to the top of your class. It's just, <laughs> you, you follow what I'm saying? So some people, they, they, they identify with the drug addicts more than they do the alcoholics. Whichever way, you can go into the fellowship. I sponsor people in both fellowships and, 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 and because I have experience in both of those fellowships. Makes sense? But, but I keep it separate when I'm sitting there talking in the, in the specific fellowship that I'm talking to. The solution is going to be the same. I've got to tell you guys, I've said it from a million podiums. If you think a drug's a drug's a drug, sit down and do a fist step with a with an alcoholic, and the next day sit down and do a fist step with a crackhead, a drug addict of any kind. It's there's there's two different worlds. Terminology's different. The detox protocol is different. The physiological damage is different. There's just it's just it's, it's all the same. That started from treatment centers that had one bus. That's the truth. That's the truth, and it's not. Go to any meeting you want to go to. What you got, bro? Well, I was just gonna say that. That's a t- that's you know, and it's funny because one time, and I've been sober a long time, and, and a guy came in and he heard somebody in, in, in our town say, "My name's so and so. I'm an alcoholic and a drug addict." And he goes, "You guys aren't real big on single us a purpose around here, are you?" And I was like, "Well, I guess I'd have to say no because I never really heard anybody talk about it for a long time." And and you know, we want to be loving, we want to be open minded, we want to be all inclusive, and I thought that it was it was. Uh, the warmest, cuddliest thing to do was to say, you know, come on in here and, and you know, I'm an alcoholic and I'm a drug addict and, and, and I'm identifying with as many people as I can. The way our tradition came about is that we had seen organizations that tried to be all things for all people and AA learned that that didn't work and we'd seen some other fellowships fail and we decided early on that we were going to be alcoholics <laughs> Working with alcoholics, and they, and it's called singleness of purpose. That, that our that our that our fellowship is about alcoholics, and that and it, and it says when it talks about that identification on page eighteen, it says until such an identification takes place, little or nothing can be accomplished. If there's not that identification, and that's what I say, if you think it's all the same, I mean, wait till the first time. Katie knows about a meeting where where the lady said, you know, I, I, my problem is with fudge. You know, and would it be okay if we, I've been craving fudge. Can we talk about fudge today? I'm like, get out, you know, I mean, because I don't understand it. But I mean, by saying, none of my sponsors, you you won't hear any of my sponsors saying I'm an alcoholic and anything in an AA meeting because it doesn't matter. What we're identifying in an AA meeting is that I have alcoholism, and I know what that means, and I can talk to you about that. And if I go to this other fellowship where we're identifying as addicts, then I'm going to say, 
I'm an addict. My name is Charlie. I'm an addict. Because in that fellowship, it applies whether I'm an addict or not. It doesn't help for me to say I'm an alcoholic and a contractor or an alcoholic and a Texan because in that fellowship, we're not identifying as Texans or contractors. We're just identifying. So it's not that we want this filthy dope fiend not to be in our midst because I am one. It's about we're desperate that this guy find a fellowship that he identifies in as much as I identify in a room of Alcoholics Anonymous. I I feel fortunate that I feel perfectly at home in in an addicts meeting or in an alcoholics meeting. Uh, I sponsor alcoholics and I sponsor alcoholic drug addicts. But, you know, if a guy tells me that he just smoked crack, I'll probably put him with somebody that just smoked crack. And remember, you tried and... I haven't had good luck with trying to do it the other way. And where it really sucks is when you get a guy that just smoked crack, and he's really kind of cool, and I like him, you know, and I'd kind of like to have him on my crew, you know, and then you're like, and then it didn't work out very well, you know, and you're like, well, that was my ego getting involved there, you know. And, and, you know, so I don't know, does that help any? I mean, it's, it's something, I've been on both sides of this issue because our group split up one time over, you know, they don't want you talking about drugs over at Northland. You're like, well, by God, drugs are a part of my story. I'm going to go over there tomorrow and talk about drugs. You know, and, 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 you know, and I don't know, I don't know what they were saying at Northland, but what I was hearing was they don't want drug addicts in their meeting. I wasn't hearing anybody talking about singleness of purpose. And that, you know, they're trying to keep it about alcoholics working with alcoholics. And to that extent, you know, I, I love the girl. I heard a girl talk one time. She talked about every time she'd say, I'm an alcoholic and a drug addict, this guy in the back of the room would stand up and he'd go, I got hemorrhoids. <laughs> and she was like, what? And then the, ne- the next time she got up and said, I- I- I'm an alcoholic and a drug addict, and he goes, I have hemorrhoids. And she said, I never knew stopping saying that I was an addict would cure hemorrhoids. But when I stopped saying you know, I was anything other than an alcoholic, he stopped identifying as a guy with hemorrhoids. You know, so... It's singleness of purpose. It's it's a silly example, I know, but it really works. At, works really well. At, we're trying. We're trying to be one thing. We're trying to be alcoholics working with alcoholics, and and, and I think that's the reason there's all these two hundred fellowships is because that identification is so important. Guys, I've never known any. I've known lots of people that came in with as agnostic belief systems or atheists. I hate God. I don't want anything to do with God. Then, but come with us anyway, because the one prerequisite is the ability to be honest. And you ask yourself point blank, do you believe that maybe there might be on some outside chance something bigger than you out there? If I can get them to say yes, something, but I don't know what that is. I, sh- me neither. Let's go. Are you willing to believe that there's something? Then we can make some progress. You do the work. I've never seen anybody not have a spiritual experience. They'll fight it tooth and nail. But somewhere, usually between <laughs> about the time they finish the fifth step and start making their amends, they crack like an egg and says, oh, my God, you'll never guess what happened. There was this butterfly this morning and all of it. <laughs> and you- and, you know, and I'm sitting there with tears in my eyes. Go, oh yeah, I know it's exactly, you know. And, I, and it's like, it, it's like, it's like we we gain access to and believe in a power greater than ourselves. And that's so all we got to do is do the work, and then we get the results. You, you follow what I'm saying? Do I think we need to lead to lead anybody to believe that they can get this thing without believing in God? I just think we do them a disservice. I'm not saying that they can't hang around. I'm not going to waste one minute with those people though. I'm just not. It's just bless you. It's like it's like we we we're a one trick pony. We got one thing we're trying to sell, and that's the spiritual experience. And so what? You know, I'm going to water that down for everybody else. Uh-uh. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. That answer your question. Where can you be most effective? I mean, this is all I'm doing. Is this? It's, I, it's amazing what. God, if, if I said it actually from the podium what people say I said, I, I mean, I would be in prison. I, I can assure you, I, I, I don't know. I think as long as you're working with somebody, this is why I know people that stay sober in the church. They don't stay sober in the church by going Sunday mornings and dropping a dollar in the basket. They stay sober. They're, every time the door is open, they're there doing something. They're helping, working with others. It's anything that you get out of your head. I just think, I think God's going to use you. It's once we do the, the work and we get through all of this stuff in the fourth step and the fifth step and the making amends, you with us? Get and you're sitting in a meeting. Guess who God's going to put you next to you? 
I mean, I've seen it a thousand times, you know. You, re you resent your parents forever and ever and ever, and all of a sudden you work through the work and you come out the other side and you don't resent your parents anymore. Guess who the next day is going to be sitting right next to you, you know? You're not going to believe what my mom did. Oh, <laughs> oh no shit. And, uh, and then here it comes, and it could be, you know, child of origin stuff. It can be it can be credit. I'm still waiting right now for, for somebody to come ask me to sponsor him that's rich and has never had problems with, with women. You with us? <laughs> Because I've never been rich, and I've always had a problem with women. And I've worked through a lot of that stuff, and I've come out the other side, and I put money in the bank today, and I don't owe a soul. You with us? I've worked through that stuff, and that's who God puts in my life. You know, poor idiots that can't say no to women. And I, <laughs> God, God's going to use you wherever you want to do. I don't care where. But, but be, just find your job, find your niche, and stay there. You'll be, you'll be golden. <laughs> But you know what? I'll take a minute on that one. Uh, only, only because, you know what? I, I, I darn made myself crazy with the Eastern meditation. You know, the sitting still and the getting calm and the, you know, clearing the mind. And I, I by nature, am a pretty high-strung individual. And uh, I, I, so w one day, I can't remember. I don't even remember where it came from. But it said uh, in that 1935 uh, dictionary, it said meditation means deep thought. And I thought, well, now I can go into some deep thought, but I, I can't go into completely clearing my mind. And so um, it was the most freeing thing I had ever experienced. And Mark helped me a lot on this was uh, I took this level of prayer and uh, I read a couple of pages of Emmett Fox because uh, he happens to be the, my spiritual leader. I don't like to get too confused with, you know, 15 spiritual leaders. I like one. Uh, and so I read a couple of pages of Emmett Fox, and I go into what, what he was talking about, and I do some contemplation on that. And then I do some incredible prayer in a really positive sense of um, how I would like for my world to be, my kids' health, my husband's health, my health, uh, my, my connection with my creator, and just really holding that up kind of in a positive light. For me as an alcoholic, I can be pretty negative. And it's, it's, it's remarkable. And it's about 15 minutes worth. And it's, it's pretty cool. But I don't do any complete silent meditation because it just made me crazy. It was the naked part. Yeah, it's a whole naked thing. <laughs> <laughs> you been watching me? <laughs> How many of y'all believe this is spiritual warfare? Any of y'all ever, ever walk around the park with that one? I mean, truly, God, I got to tell you guys, the most courageous thing that any of us do is try to get sober. Whether in, we're in our families, in Al-Anon or in AA or whatever, we try to, we're trying to, to align our will with God and get on a spiritual path. And, and I got to tell you guys, it, there's, there's a battle here. It's, it's, uh, M. Scott Peck wrote a book in the 80s, I think it was in the early 90s, about, about the road less traveled. The road less traveled is the spiritual path, and there's a reason for that. That's why we catch so much flack in meetings when we start talking about God and stuff is because there's a lot of people out there that want to poo-poo this. It's just, it's, it's difficult. We talked about it last night. The path gets narrower, not wider. The rewards get greater. The longer we're sober, life gets better, but the path gets narrower. And that's, that's, some, that's why so many people, they can't, we think this is just going to be a piece of cake. Or I'm going to put the plug in the jug. It's like like Katie was talking about, and everything's just going to be okay. And it's just not. Some of us grow spiritually, and our significant others. I had a marriage of nine years sober, and, and went through that divorce. It just we just we just went like this. We we stopped growing spiritually together, and and we went two different directions. It was nothing. Uh, either one of us. There was no blame involved. We just headed in different directions. My, I'm going to be on the spiritual path because I don't have a choice. I, I have to stay on that path in order to stay sober. If I get off of it, I die. So I have to do what i got to do. But i got to tell you this, guys. It's a lot of people hide out in AA, and the family goes to hell in a handbasket. And, and part of this is, you know, we use the fellowship as an excuse to stay away from the family and maybe not do the things that were necessary. I was talking to, I think, Bruce earlier. Was, we were talking. He said, I couldn't be here last night because I had a, 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 a school deal with my daughter. And I'm thinking, that that's crystal clear about what this is about. I'm going to go to an AA function or go to my school's or my daughter's recital or whatever it was. It's like... That's what we're supposed to be doing. But in, in interspersed in this, we get to also do some AA stuff. You with us? Recovery is not. That's why I don't go with this. I go to a meeting every day. I don't. You know, I just. 
I got a wife and a bike and a garden, and you know, I got a, I got a full life too. You know, and, and I'm I'm going to ask my family to come along with me in this deal, but I can't force it down their throat. So, good luck with you. You know, prayers I, I with you. I'll visit with you afterwards. I got a couple. Well, you know, I uh, it, I go pretty elementary on that one, only because um, we're always looking to blame God. For any of our heartache, if it's if it's death or or uh, you know a, a tragedy where someone didn't die and they're you know immobilized or whatever, we believe that there's all kinds of tragedies and God did it. And I I always go really elementary on the fact that um, their belief system is is off kilter if they believe that that is of any any nature of God that. Um, I, I really try to get people, I, I don't try to get them on any sort of religious kick of any kind, but I just say the God of my understanding is nothing but of all loving. You know, sometimes in meetings you hear this one thing that makes me absolutely crazy, and it's like, watch out what you pray for. <laughs> like God's going, oh, I've been waiting for her to pray for patience, man. There's a flat tire, and we're going to bounce a check. And you're like, this is not of God's nature, right? This is an, an all-loving creature, and We Agnostics is a beautiful part of our book. I think it's one of the least read chapters uh, of our big book that explains that we need to set aside all our prejudice and, and open our minds to a, a, a new understanding of God. And one of the things is, is that, you're, you know, who didn't come in here damaged by God? Either I didn't dig him or I hated him. You know, I mean, they told me when I was a kid and my mom died when I was nine that God needed her. Well, I hated him. I don't, I don't want nothing to do with him. But when you're, when you're served up with a first step experience, I've got no choice but to look at this and be willing to. And so one of the things that I continue to go with is if I'm praying for patience, I'm telling God I am prepared for patience. And all he does for me is gives me heightened awareness. The same situation with the white car deal, right? I go out there and tell you, look how many white cars there are. All of a sudden, you're going to see white cars. They've always been there. At your level of patience, you've just been asleep to it. All of a sudden, you ask God for it. and He goes, okay, if you're ready for it, you're going to start seeing it now. You're just going to be more aware of it. So that's why, I, I, and I, I, I'm pretty, uh, I'm pretty black and white with somebody. If they come in hating God, I go, well, you, you, it's it's your concept of God that is is the damaged part. And so I, that's how I walk them through it. And they're certainly welcome to keep it, but what a shame, you know, what a shame. I want to close with a little piece out of the big book that I've been closing talks with for a long time. This is from page 100 in the big book. It says, Both you and the new man must walk day by day in the path of spiritual progress. If you persist, remarkable things will happen. When we look back, we realize that the things which came to us when we placed ourselves in God's hands were better than anything we could have planned. Follow the dictates of a higher power, and you will presently live in a new and wonderful world no matter what your present circumstances. It's been a real honor to be here with you guys this weekend. Stay out there in the trenches, and thanks for having us. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.